The following presentation was recorded at the Aquaponics Association Conference in Tucson, Arizona on September 22, 2013. For more information or to join the Aquaponics Association, please visit their website at www.aquaponicsassociation.org. So I'll go over uh, some of the details about um, how these things work and a little bit of the physics of how the uh, airflow uh, moves through these. Um, and it's very helpful to understand um, this part of it if you're going to try to build your own. Uh, the books also uh, explain this uh, fairly well too, but we'll go through it. And if you have questions, just uh, speak up. And so what you start off with is um, essentially a burn tunnel in here. And most people just call it a J-tube, and you'll see why in the next diagram. But what happens is you um, put your fuel, your wood, uh, down in this end, and then um, light it and it, it starts to burn this way and then comes up. Um, as you all know, heat rises, hot air balloons, anything, your fireplace, um, whatnot. Um, but just like this, that's not enough to get it to burn because heat wants to come up this way and also the flames are gonna wanna also come up uh, this direction too because there's no drafting uh, created with this yet. So what you do is you need to add in a heat riser and Essentially, what happens is once this area starts to uh, warm up, it starts drafting the fire up in this direction. And so you get the fresh air coming down through your wood, it's burning down in here, and then it shoots up this way. So the heat rise is a very important uh, component. Yes, sir? Yes. It's, uh, it can be tricky. I do that with mine and basically I just set the duct on there and you can use some, um, you know, some refractory cement on there, something that can more or less tolerate it. That's one of the reasons why um, the cob is so popular because you, it just, you know, you can mold it around any gaps that you might have and then the first burn it heats up and turns it into, you know, essentially like a brick. You cob it before the barrel is on or anything? Yes. Yeah, the whole inner part would get built first. So by directing the air upwards past uh, the feed tube, you're drawing the air? It draws the air down so you don't get any smoke uh, okay. coming back out of the system. Yes, sir. Does that mean you get an initial small amount of smoke or you try to start it? Yeah, typically. Yeah, typically what somebody will do, and even in a, like a home stove, they'll take a piece of newspaper, light it on fire, jam it into this area so it forces that up into there, and that's just enough to get it going. Um, when I start mine up uh, with the pellets, what I'll typically do is I just have a little um, propane torch that you know, plumbers use for soldering or something, and just stick it under there, light it for you know, 10, 15 seconds, just enough to get a little bit of airflow going through there. I also cheat a little bit with the pellets because when I start up the pellets, I put a little diesel fuel in it too to, to, to help it out. Just, it saves me a little bit of time. That's, that's strictly what that's for. So the next part, um, and this is a relatively important part too, is you want to insulate your heat riser. The goal is to keep this thing as hot as possible inside this combustion area. Because what starts to happen is once the wood um, for lack of better terms, it starts burning, but it essentially starts gasifying. The wood, it heats up and it releases any of the gases that are inside of that. So actually, you have combustion. Um, you have, after a while, you have some um, coals in here that are sort of like burning away, heating up the wood. It forces the wood to emit its gas out. And then you get a combustion in here. So you get good combustion in here. And by putting uh, insulation around that heat riser, it keeps getting hotter and hotter, so there's other gases that are being, being emitted out of the wood, and you have a chance to burn some of those secondary gases. And it just, you know, that's how we end up with just CO2 and water that comes out of these things. What's the insulation that you use? I use Rockwool. Um, it's been okay. It works fairly well. My heat riser is also stainless steel, which, uh, it gets frowned upon typically. Um, both rock wool and stainless steel usually have a um, degradation point at about 1500 degrees and I have burned through them. Usually people just wrap it in cob, they'll add vermiculite into the cob 
or they'll make like a, a housing chamber around the chimney and just pack it with vermiculite. Um, I sort of like to experiment, so I went with the rock wool. I could get it at the local hardware store easier than I could with the vermiculite. And it works. I've melted it. And I have, I, if you ever watch any of my videos, I have a whole series about uh, the rocket mass heater. And they actually go into a lot more detail uh, than I'm, what I'm showing here. Um, and you can see some of my successes and some of the failures. And it shows uh, my first one, I just used standard galvanized uh, chimney pipe inside of that and the whole thing just rotted out. I knew it was going to, but it's part of it was a learning experience on, on how to understand how the rocket mass heater worked. And then I've switched over to a, a stainless steel heat riser, again, because I didn't want to have to make up cob and everything else. We don't have a big source of clay out our way, so it's you know, cheaper for me to spend a couple hundred bucks on a stainless steel tube and just sit it in place and try to go and source out uh, clay and everything. So, after that, we need to install a heat exchanger. And typically, it's a 55 gallon drum. You can almost get them for free from any place that, like a garage or something that deals with oil and they you know, pump oil out, pump it into a car, and now they have all these waste uh, uh, barrels left over. And so what happens is you have all this heat coming up and it hits the top of this barrel and it starts radiating, radiating out some of that heat into your uh, space. A lot of people, they'll put teapots up there. You can easily boil water um, off the top of that barrel. And so you have this hot gas, and just because of the physics of hot air rising, it comes up in here, hits the barrel, it starts radiating out its heat uh, throughout the barrel, and you get a cooling action um, just because you're, you're losing some of that heat. So then the, um, the gases then start going down around the perimeter of the barrel. And so now you have a cooler air temperature in here. So that's also helping with the draw of that air. So you have drawing coming up. And now that it's cooling, it starts creating a, a draft, downwards draft in the system. And that just helps you know, keep that flow moving and uh, not having to use any fans or anything to force the air through the system. So then next is your mass, and usually it's a, a fairly long mass. It could, you could easily put in 30 or 40 feet of uh, ductwork in, in your mass area. And you want to absorb any of the heat that didn't get radiated out of your barrel. So you have your barrel radiating out a bunch of heat, and then your exhaust goes underneath. In the greenhouse, we put the floor, or in those earlier pictures, I showed the cob benches. And it just those benches just keep absorbing up that heat. And then the rest of the waste, um, I show it just exiting up, but like I was saying earlier, people just sometimes just vent it right out of the side of their buildings. So you don't need a, a tall chimney in a building. You know, usually any building code, you have to get a chimney up you know, 10 feet above your roof line and all that other stuff. And a lot of that's for fire safety. If you have, if you have a chimney fire, you wanna make sure that fire is well enough away from your building. Um, but on my greenhouse, I just I come up and then vent out through the uh, the side of the building, and it's just like, you know, it just sort of softly blows out. Yes, sir. Do you want to say a quick thing about the height of the heat riser? Uh, sort of like as proximity to the top of the barrel. Yeah, I um, have about two inches from the top of the heat riser to the barrel. Basically, um, throughout the whole design, you don't want any points that restrict the airflow because then that does you know, it will, it will help slow things down. Um, so typically, um, mine is an eight inch uh, pipe. It's class, they just call it an eight inch system. So you have an eight inch uh, ductwork pipe in there. So if you calculate out um, the area of a circle, it's 50 something square inches of space. So you wanna make sure like in your burn tunnel, you have about that same amount of uh, square inches. And then once you get into the barrel, you have such a large area um, that's not a restriction point. And then your chimney should be the, the same diameter pipe or um, you know, same square inches as the heat riser, so just so the chimney's not acting as a restrictor. You can throw like a 90 in there to bring your pipe back around. Is that restrictive? Yeah, it is restrictive. So nobody's ever complained about that. Um, I think just because the airflow is just slow enough and working its way through, it hasn't been an issue. Another question? Yeah. 
I've seen some fairly large ones where people have just laid them underneath the entire floor of their greenhouse. Uh, what they'll typically do is instead of just having one pipe come out, out of their um, the heater area, they'll take it and split it like four times, run it underneath the entire floor under four different areas, and then recombine it and then vent it up outside. So you can run it a, a pretty good distance. You know, technically you do get some restriction, some added restriction to the system. That you know, the longer your piping is going to be, but they, they can get fairly long. In mine, yeah, I have some uh, measurements I'll show later, but just as a sneak peek, the inside of these, they run you know, about 1,500, 2,000 degrees when they're burning. Um, my exhaust is about 110 degrees. Can you get it cold enough, the air cold enough that you would want to siphon the wrong way? Now, usually, um, I haven't seen any that they've gotten it that efficient, because you're right, you probably could run into a problem. If, if this pipe is all of a sudden cooler than your air temperature in the building, it would you know, attempt to keep, create a downdraft at that point. But there's, there is a little bit of waste heat in all these. So, but you know, considering you, you're heating something up to 1,500 degrees or so, and you know, that's an incredible amount of heat, and when it leaves the building, it's 110, 120 degrees. It's just the efficiency of these things is just incredible. So this is uh, my system when I was setting it up. And you can see here that um, this is the burn uh, tunnel and the, the feeder area here. And part of the heat riser, I actually stuck a second piece on here. And then the, the barrel would go over this. The gases come down around the barrel, they come in here, and then I looped it around uh, through the floor. And this is, um, I just buried mine in sand. Um, sort of a non-permanent thing, because I'm a big experimenter. I want to be able to dig it up and play with it and replace parts and whatnot. Um, but you know, that's, that's how it's buried in the system. And this is um, it running um, when I was just using wood. I did a double barrel, which I don't know of anybody that really does that, but I really wanted some good drafting in this thing. Typically, people just use one 55-gallon uh, drum, so they stand you know, three and a half feet tall, and uh, that's about it. But I wanted to have a nice, tall chimney in that thing and just guarantee I'm getting a really good draft. And it definitely drafted really well. And typically, um, you know, I have one of those uh, little laser um, infrared uh, heater things. It only goes up to 500 degrees, and it's much hotter than that at the top of the barrel. I'll read around 500 degrees here. So, and then down in here, it reads at around 300 degrees or so. So, you know, that the barrel's radiating out heat, and as it's radiating, radiating, radiating the heat out of it, it's you know cooling off as in there as it's inside of the barrel. Now long before um, I even put the rocket mass heater together, when we were building the greenhouse, I was planning on um, trying to use the floor in the greenhouse to capture some of that extra heat. So I had this grandiose plan, and I'm actually using it to um, extract some of the heat off of that barrel. Uh oh, <laughs> you know, we try to extract some of the heat off of the barrel and, um, did it work? There we go. And try to store it underneath the building because I knew just heating the space with the heat rating off the barrel, it was just going to get too hot inside the greenhouse. So I, I wanted to try to capture some more of that. Okay, hopefully that works now. So in here, there's a, just a standard you know, food grade. It really doesn't even matter. You could use a 55-gallon drum. This is my, uh, the, the manifold where I'll put the heat into. And then I just zigzagged a whole bunch of 4-inch uh, corrugated pipe underneath the floor, surrounded it um, all in stone so it gets a little airflow underneath the floor. And then throughout the perimeter, um, it can vent out. 
And what happens is I have a, a nice big fan in there that I'm just sucking the, the heat off of the rocket mass heater and pumping it down underneath the floor. And so that's it. Technically, I'm sort of cheating because I'm using electricity. I've been criticized by a few people for uh, not being a pure rocket mass heater uh, person because I'm using some electricity to uh, move some of the air around. But I wanted to be able to heat my greenhouse. So this is part of the, the phase two where um, here I made up my pellet feeder and it's basically uh, another oil drum, a small one, 35 gallon, and it has this hopper in here that just goes down into the area where the wood used to be and this is a special little grate that I had made up that just, it just keeps feeding the pellets in there. I, I could run it 24 hours a day if I wanted to. And then I um, also added on an Acura Legend uh, aluminum core radiator um, at the top of it and put some fancy piping here. It is inside of the, the casing. And this is my uh, fish tank for the, the system. And essentially I'm just pumping the water right from the fish tank through the radiator and back into the fish tank again. Uh, whether it has solids in it or not, it's not filtered. I didn't want to put in a heat exchanger loop and deal with you know, any antifreeze or possible contamination to get into the fish. Um, Aluminum is usually not recommended to uh, put in your aquaponic system um, because if your pH swings way too high or way too low, it can become uh, toxic to your fish. Um, but again, I was experimenting with it and it actually works well. Um, so you can see now the, the barrel here is completely gone and it's covered by this lovely ugly shroud and that is just a big cover that goes over the whole thing and I'm blowing air, sucking air through this around that barrel and then pumping it down underneath the floor and it's going through another radiator and the radiator um, heating that I'm getting out of that it, the water comes out around 130, 140 degrees. I'm pumping uh, five gallons an hour, or five gallons a minute through that. Um, it's roughly the equivalent of heating using a 35,000 BTU uh, water heater on the system. So I've now, I now have this rocket mass heater that has multiple functions. It's heating the air of the greenhouse because I'm still getting heat radiating out from even this uh, housing. I'm also heating the water uh, for the fish, and the fish really like that hot water. It, it's funny, people are like, oh, you're going to burn your fish. Right where the water's just pouring right back into the, into the tank, all the koi go right up to it, and they just start swimming around in there, and they're actually fighting for space in that hot water. So it's sort of neat to, to see that. And they know as soon as I turn on that valve for it, the water starts splashing in there. It's not even hot yet, and they're up there because they know it's going to get nice and warm. Yes? Um, no, I haven't. I, it's, the water's not getting superheated. It's just, you know, I'm pumping it through quickly enough where it's only, you know, getting 130 degrees or so. So I guess technically I could be, you know, promoting legionnaires or something because that's right in that sweet spot of other, you know, harmful bacteria, I guess. So I'm not heating it enough to sanitize it. It's not like a, a steam uh, system. Um, but I haven't noticed any change in the water quality. It's just the fish are a little bit happier because they can, you know, swim around in warm water. Yes? I don't know if there's a size designation, but basically how big is that heater and how much fuel are you consuming and what size uh, uh, greenhouse are you keeping? This is a, a 1,200 square foot building okay. and 800 of it is greenhouse space. So, you know, the majority of it is just polycarbonate uh, twin wall paneling. And this is this size heater is actually overkill uh, for this uh, greenhouse. It's one of the issues people ask me a lot is I want to I have a you know the Harbor Freight 10 by 12 or the the Rimmall uh, kit greenhouses. I don't think you could put one of these inside of it. It would just you know you'd suck all the air out of the building and just get super hot in there. So it's you know it's it's really designed for. A building uh, size uh, greenhouse. Yes. But speaking of what you just said there, have you ever thought about taking an outside air intake? That way yeah. You can avoid 